Hello, welcome back to my channel. This I am Beth and this is Spiral Path Healing Arts. And today it's a beautiful sunny Saturday here in Chattanooga and I have the day off from my regular work and um, which is kind of rare for me. Uh, but it's also welcome because I haven't had much time to be here in my workspace, um, in my sewing space, crafting space, uh, for a full day. So I'm going to take advantage of it. And today I am going to sew <laughs> for the first time in a long, long time. And I'm other than the little, little bits here and there, I'm going to actually start and maybe even finish a project today. And I thought it might be fun to share it with you. So what I am making today are a couple aprons and the reason I chose to make aprons is because I love aprons and I don't wear them as often anymore as I used to. I have a small collection of antique aprons that I've collected over the years and most of those um, they're in storage right now I don't have them uh, out so I can't show you my collection maybe that'll be a video another day um, especially when I still lived in the Midwest. I would go to antique stores and resale shops and yard sales and uh, estate sales of these old farm women and pick up their old aprons that they, you know, had. And um, I just, I, I love the stories behind aprons. I love the history behind aprons, the different fabrics and sometimes decorations. I have a few that are have um, embroidery and things on them. And just thinking about why they were made, how they were, uh, maybe the holidays that and fa big family dinners and farm dinners that they were used um, used for um, creating. And I just I just love all the energy behind old aprons. But on a more practical sense, um, I love aprons because I don't like doing laundry, even though I've done a couple different videos about laundry lately. Um, and I am tend to sometimes like when, especially if I'm cooking or preparing food or even eating, I will, you know, we all do that. We use our, we spill things on us or you have a napkin or something. And as far as being sustainable and, um, I think using aprons is very helpful because, um, you can kind of use them as a napkin as you're uh, cooking and, and working. You can wipe your hands on them. Practicality, a lot of our clothes, as we know as women, do not have pockets in them. And so having an apron with some big pockets when you're doing housework to, oh, I got, I picked this up in the living room and it needs to go upstairs or back in the kitchen or whatever and stick it in the pocket um, or our phones that we carry around with us now all the time. Those kinds of things, the practicality of an apron. And it does help to protect our clothes. Um, I have, um, I like especially this time of year when it's cold to wear warm sweaters and I have a few like hand knit sweaters and, um, or, um, thrifted cashmere or thrifted merino wool sweaters that I love, but they take hand washing and laying out to dry and they're, they're a little bit more maintenance work. So to throw an apron over them when I'm eating or cooking or cleaning, um, really helps to save on having to do that laundry over and over again. And last year in 2021, I had the um, honor and privilege of going down to Selma, Alabama with a group of friends for a couple days. Um, I'd never been other than just the corner of Alabama that's really near here, near Chattanooga. Um, any opportunity to visit or um, learn anything about Alabama. And so I took this opportunity to go with these friends and while there, we stayed um, at a place that was owned by a woman there, and she's an artist and um, just a really cool gal. And uh, I noticed that she wore these aprons every day, practically. I got thinking, oh, what a great idea, because especially when you're doing artwork and you're getting, you know, you may have glue or paint or whatever to protect your clothes, um, and then when you want to, if you need to run out to the store or greet, um, greet a friend or something at the door or whatever, uh, being able to just take that apron off real quick and have your clothes underneath. Great idea. So I thought I, that idea stuck in my head and the style of apron that she wore is what I'm making today. And it is this is a simplicity pattern that I'm using today. And I'm going to be making this little apron in the bottom, but I do like the longer style, the same apron. This 
because it looks almost like a little sundress. But I'm going to be making the short one for today. Um, I may make a long one uh, later. This one has ruffles. I'm not a ruffle person. One, I don't like sewing ruffles. And two, it's just not my style. But um, I thought I could make some of these just to have some aprons to wear over my clothes when I'm doing housework or indoor, maybe gift them to some people that I know will uh, appreciate an apron. So uh, let's get started. Let me show you um, kind of the process. I may not take you through the entire sewing process, but I'm gonna show you just some of the things that I'm doing here and the fabric that I'm using. So this fabric is some of the hand-dyed yardage that I got from my sister last year. And there's actually, I have two pieces of it here. I'm gonna try to cut out um, two aprons at the same time. Yesterday, I, I ironed all of this and got it all squared up. And this is the folded edge that's closest to me and the selvage edge is closest to the camera. And I'm gonna just lay these out right on top of each other. Um, I don't recommend doing this if you're, you know, sewing something that is more intricate and or more fitted, but I'm gonna make sure that there are no wrinkles underneath and everything is lined up perfectly square and straight here so I can put my pattern pieces. Now, something else I did yesterday, since the pattern came with a multi-size pattern, which means that there are like four sizes uh, for each pattern piece, I took, I love this, it's one of my favorite sewing tips, is this is a very thin, lightweight, non-woven interfacing. Um, and it comes by a bunch of different names. And I laid out my pattern on this table, smoothed it all out, and traced over it for the size that I was using and the pattern variation that I was using so that I didn't have to cut my tissue paper pattern. Um, and then I can, I also traced out a couple other sizes that I'm gonna make at other times. And, you know, put on, put, labeled it with the basic information the basic um, markings and notches and things like that it needs, and then just roughly cut it out. And I'm gonna lay this out on my fabric. Oops, that one goes up here. And you'll see, this is not going to be a comprehensive sewing lesson, <laughs> but one thing you wanna make sure you put on all your pattern pieces when you trace them are the grain lines. Because if I were just to put this on any old way, this is an even weave fabric, and if it's cut on the bias, it will hang funny. So I wanna make sure it's cut square to the um, straight of grain of fabric. That's just a little, a little sewing thing. Um, and there are so many tips and tricks on getting it perfect to the grain. I'm gonna eyeball it for now. I'll check it bef before I cut. And this is also, this two pieces of this pattern go on the, uh, the fold. So I'm going to line this piece up with the fold. And I'm not pinning yet. I'm just laying everything out and then I'll tweak it and get it pinned down. So, um, I could just start pinning here. I always try to conserve as much fabric as possible, especially when I'm using a special fabric like this that uh, is kind of one of a kind. The other reason I really like using this um, non-woven pattern fabric pattern material is because it as you can see it's not shifting on this on the fabric and i'm going to cut these with my rotary cutter partly because i'm cutting through four layers of fabric um, it'll cut smoother but it will also um, when you get scissors under here you're lifting the fabric and you're going to be shifting it a little bit and it just i think it's you get a more accurate cut so i don't want a lot of pins around the edges that I may accidentally nick with my um, rotary cutter. So I use pattern weights to hold down my patterns quite often. Um, this little piece here that wants to curl up, I'm gonna throw at least one pin in here. I'm gonna go ahead and get this all laid out and pinned and there, I'm just gonna start there. Um, the rotary cutter, it has a safety thing. You can even lock it so it doesn't open accidentally, especially if you have kids or anything in your house and you don't want because uh, it's a dangerous tool. And I'm going to start to cut. A 
couple other notes about using a rotary cutter. Uh, make sure you have a self-healing mat, cutting mat underneath your cutter. Never cut directly on a table. Um, this one is happens to be the same size as my cutting table, which is very convenient, but they have they make many different sizes. I have some small ones on a site next to my machine, kind of for small projects. But um, and also when you're cutting, always cut away from yourself. And if you're holding something, never cut toward your hand. <laughs> a lot of logical things. Um, but yeah, you want to be very careful because it's a very sharp blade on there. And they also make other sizes of cutters. This is a, a nice little small one that I use for little curves and things. Hey, it cut off, it cut better through the four layers than the bigger one did. So also if you don't have a rotary cutter and you're using scissors, every sewer will know that you gotta have a good pair of fabric shears. And that's all that you use them for. You never use your fabric shears for paper. Oh God, no. Or, you know, opening packaging. And uh, find yourself a good place to get your shears sharpened regularly. Um, these are a pair that I was given. I don't know where my, I have a better pair somewhere. But recently, in the last couple of years, I found, I did, could not find anywhere here in Chattanooga that did uh, scissor sharpening, uh, especially for sewing shears. So a lot of knife sharpeners down here and blade makers, but not scissor because they have to be rebalanced and, and sharpened in a very particular way. So, um, and these are a little bit bent. These were given to me uh, a number of years ago by someone who was clearing out his former wife's sewing supplies. So I don't think they match up real well. So they don't cut real great. Um, but I sent, I found a place online that you could package up all your scissors and send them away. And it was very quick. Um, if I can find the link, because again, it was like a couple years ago, I will uh, link it in the description. Um, and you send all your scissors away. And at that time, of course, pre-COVID, uh, I got them back within a week. And I sent two pairs of sewing shears. I think I sent five scissors a, a total. Two pairs of sewing shears, a pair of uh, hair shears that I'd found in a resale shop that were dull, but they were really nice um, barber shears. And then a little pair of embroidery shears that had just like a one and a half inch blade on them. And I was like, I don't know if they can sharpen these or not, but if they can, they, they would be really nice. And um, got them back and they were so sharp. It made such a, oh, and a pair of, another pair of um, just general scissors that I, I'd had around for a while. So they came back, they actually came back. It was really cute. The packaging had, band-aids in it and a in a in a note saying you know these are going to be way sharper than they were when you sent them to us so be very careful when you're using them uh because you can really especially the hair shears um could be pretty dangerous so um i was really happy with the service and i don't remember the name of the company but like i said if i can find it in my records i will link it below um because having a good pair of sharp scissors any other at all of your tools having them well maintained makes all the difference in the world and will help them last longer. I would rather have, these are Ginger brand, which is a very well-known brand, but like I said, I think the blade's slightly bent on these because I can see the light between it. Uh, so probably somebody used it to open a box or something like that. Now that I live alone, I don't have to keep them in a, you know, protected <laughs> place like I used to, but um, where nobody else could use, could get a hold of them. But, um, you know, this is four layers of fabric and, Right, like butter, just right through them. So, um, again, in a, in the in the idea of sustainability, having a really good investment, investing in a really good pair of shears and keeping them maintained and um, protected will serve you for years and years. I think I've had these for close to thirty years, and I've had them sharpened maybe twice, and. Um, well, the last time was they were long overdue, so but um, they'll probably go another decade between, before they need to be sharpened again. And then rotary blades, um, there are ways to sharp resharpen rotary bit blades, but you can get a pack of ten rotary blades um, replacement from blades um, pretty inexpensively, and just change them out when they get dull. Um, not necessarily the most sustainable. I don't know if there's a way to recycle the blades. Um, I haven't looked into that. That's an idea. Um, but again, if you only use them for fabric, you only use them on the cutting mat and you're very careful. Now I have another somewhere in my other crafting supplies, another rotary cutter that I 
do use occasionally for paper and things like that and leather and stuff like that so that I'm not damaging my sewing wood. But I think this has been used quite a bit. It's probably time to change it out. So that's just a little note on your cutting tools and just re taking good care, investing in good tools to start with and taking good care of them once you have them is really a huge benefit when you are um, going to make your own stuff. Okay. okay, so there we go. It's now time to start uh, assembling. Okay, so now we're ready to sew. I've got everything cut out. I've got my iron heating up and I've got my sewing machines set up and um, I have changed my needle threaded, got the thread that matches, my bobbins all ready. I also took a few minutes to get out my serger and set it up, which took me a few minutes in a YouTube video to do because it was set for cover lock instead of uh, overlock. And uh, it's been a minute since I've used it and I had to kind of refresh myself on how to convert it from one to the other. But that's done. And um, I'm gonna note that if I put my sewing machine in the shot to know that to just explain a little bit, uh, I'm trying not to make excuses here, but I have a very high-end, um, nice electronic computerized sewing machine. And the reason I have it is because I used to work for a sewing machine dealer and I bought it when I worked there. Um, and it's not the top of the line and it's not um, the current top of the line, it's a decade old, but um, I would not have ever been able to afford this machine had I not worked for the dealer. So that said, do not have, please, when you're watching these videos of me sewing, do not get sewing machine envy. It's really easy to think, oh, I have to have all of that if I'm gonna be able to sew at that same level. You don't. You can get a really good, reliable mechanical machine or basic electronic machine um, at a resale shops sometimes. Um, I've had a few. One of the best places I recommend to find a good machine is to go to a sewing machine dealer that takes trade-ins. And quite often they will have a little shelf or back room or maybe get to know the tech there. And they'll take an older machine in on trade. Their tech will clean it, tune it up, get the timing set, get it all oiled and, and everything and make sure it runs. And then they'll sell it. Um, you're not going to get it as cheap that way from someone like that as you will if you find one on a garage sale or a resale shop. But you will know it's been recently maintained and tested and probably, I know in the shop I used to work at, uh, after our tech would work on the machine on the machines we took in and for trade, have us sew a little bit on them, the, the, as he called it, his girls out front. Okay, you know, whatever. Um, we would sew on it just to make sure it was, a, you know, take it through its paces. So um, that is a great way if you're, especially if you're not experienced. Now, if you if you've sewn for a while or you know a little bit about sewing machines or you are mechanically inclined. There are lots of YouTube videos out there on how to clean and maintain and tune up your machines, especially the older, like the older Singers, Elmas, Janomis, um, Vikings, you know, get those old, old mechanical uh, machines um, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, I don't, I have had the um, kind of first and second generation computerized machines and I wouldn't recommend them. Yeah, you can get them at a great price. It's because the computer modules in them are um, obsolete, just like our old desktop computers with floppy disks are op obsolete now. We can't use them because they're too slow. They don't connect to the internet. They don't have USB ports. They don't, um, you know, a lot of the, the operating systems are not compatible with the current operating systems on our laptops. So I would shy away from those. You're better off with a 40-year-old machine than you are a 20-year-old machine at this point, I think, personally. Um, that said, my machine is about 10 years old and she's still going strong and I love her and I'm going to keep her for as long as I can. Um, same thing with sergers. You do not need a serger to sew. I, for a period of time, was making, and I'm probably going to go back to that again, but I used to, I, I have been a garment sewer for most of my sewing lifetime and having a serger speeds things up. It's great for sewing knits. I like to sew a lot of knits. Um, and uh, like I used to make my own bathing suits occasionally, and it, it's it's invaluable. Can you do that with a regular sewing machine? You can if you have a zigzag or a, a stretch stitch on your sewing machine. You can easily do that. Um, 
and there are other seam finishes you can use that are not overlock seam finishes. But since I have one, I use it. <laughs> and that's as simple as that. But I could make this entire project without my serger um, easily and have it turn out just as well. So it's more about the techniques and things than it is about the, um, the machine that you're using. Let's get sewing. And one last thing about whatever sewing machine you're sewing on, maintenance and good needles are your two most important aspects of using your machine. Uh, I know when I worked at the sewing machine dealer, people would come in with their machines and have problems like it's not stitching right or it's nest the bird nesting underneath or this, that, the other. And I'm like, when's the last time you changed your needle? And they never changed their needle. Um, I have so many stories I could tell about from just sewing stories that are probably boring to anyone else but me. But um, so uh, every new, every project, get a fresh needle. Your needles, pack it, packs, you know, I don't, I don't know what they're running nowadays. I haven't, I, again, when I worked at the sewing machine dealer, I would pick up packets of uh, needles all the time cheap. So um, I have a little bit of a back stock of needles. It'll make your life just like having sharp scissors, sharp cutting instruments, um, having sharp needles and the right needle for the project. There are different needles for different projects and universal needles are universal needles. They're, they work okay for most things, but they're not perfect for everything. So uh, if you're sewing on knits, get a ballpoint knit needle. If you're sewing like I am today on a tight woven cotton, get a sharp needle. Um, and if you're sewing on canvas or heavyweight things or multiple layers of things, get a top stitch or jeans needle. So I could make entire videos, and I debated at one time about starting a YouTube channel of just about sewing tips. Um, but that's not really where my life is at right now. So I'm just going to leave you with that. And we're going to start sewing. And again, I don't think I'm going to take you through step by step. I'm just going to show you some of the things. If you're using a commercial pattern, there will be a sheet that has all the instructions. And for some people, this is Greek and they can't, unless they're, unless you are Greek and you read Greek, um, good for you, ancient Greek. Um, but it does take you through step by step. And this is a pretty in, uh, simple project. And again, I'm not going to go step by step through it with you on how to lay out your fabric, how to cut your fabric and how to, what order of things to, to sew in. If you're like me and you've been sewing forever, um, which I literally feel like I have been sewing forever. I don't remember not sewing. So I was one of the lucky ones. I realized of my generation who had family who taught me to sew. Um, that's not the case with a lot of people my age or younger anymore. I'm going to get sewing and then we'll see what the end project. And if, as I'm coming through, if I come up with some other little things, tips and tip tricks or things I want to show you, um, I will come back. So what I'm doing here is stay stitching these curved edges. And that is basically just a straight stitch along these curved edges to keep them from stretching as I sew and coming out of shape. So now I'm going to do some of my first seaming and I'm gonna use the serger. And I have it set up for four step, four thread overlock. And uh, it's gonna be real quick and kind of loud. As you can see, as I overlock this, it trims, stitches, finishes the seam all in one pass. So that's where the time savings really comes in. And that is that. It's our first surged finished seam. But here is the seam. Nice sturdy seam. And I'm going to go press. Pressing is really important. So um, I'll see you maybe over at the ironing board. So probably one of the biggest mistakes or emissions, I should say, that I see a lot of beginner sewers do or not do, as the case may be, is to not press as you sew. Um, I see some beautiful finished product projects on different things on the internet, 
and if just a good pressing would make all the difference in the world on how the final product comes out. So, as you see, I pressed the seam as it was before I opened the seam up, and I want my seam allowance to be pressed toward the yoke on this. Pressing makes all the difference in how your finished product project will look um, in the end. All right, so I have the shoulder seams and side seams done, which are really the main uh, part of this. I have to attach the pockets and I have to bind the edges. Now I made this, these are smalls, and I am decidedly not a small. Um, I'm going to make either the medium or the large for myself um, because I'm noticing like the, as an apron, it will work, but my, my bum is gonna show. So if I wanted to wear this, it's like a little um, jumper dress. Uh, it's gonna be not going to cover as much as I would like it to cover. And it is about mid thigh on me, just, yeah. So again, as a kitchen apron or a household apron, it's really cute. And look how the dyed fabric patterning placed on that. Uh, I'd like to tell you that I did that on purpose, but I think it was a happy accident. Well, it was the way the fabric was dyed uh, on the bolts. I mean, uh, I did not dye this fabric. My sister did. So, um, but I do really like the way this turned out. So I have pockets that I'm gonna put on here. This also would be, I think I could modify, I mean, it would be a triangle. You could put like a, a pocket across the front. You could put shallow little individual like pockets, maybe two rows, a dozen little divided pockets for egg gathering. For an egg gathering apron would be really cute for that if you are a chicken person and I hope to someday be a chicken person. But let me show you the back. Um, also, I am wearing a very bulky sweatshirt hoodie under this. Uh, so that also, with it being the wrong size for me, uh, adds to the fact that it's not laying real great. But you can see how it crisscrosses. And so there's no ties, no um, anything. It's a, yeah, it's a little tight across the upper part here because it's too small for me. But um, super cute. And then it's just going to, I don't know if I'm going to use some contrasting fabric to make my binding. I got to look in my stash and see. I have plenty of leftover extra fabric of this dyed fabric to make the bias binding. I just don't know if I want to use it for that. I think I might want to use just a plain blue or something to make the binding. Um, or I don't know if I have anything in my stash that is this beautiful chartreuse, but wouldn't that be pretty? Um, so I'm going to put the pockets on and bind the edges on both of them. I have to cut the binding. That's going to take me a minute. So I'm probably going to go take a little, a little break to drink a cup of tea before I continue. But I'm really happy with this little project. So I took a little break uh, after I got these all put together and I had the pockets put on because the next step is going to take a little bit more time and effort. I needed a little break. And then my break ended up being a little longer because my little helper here, I sat down in front of the television while I had a snack and turned on YouTube or no, oh, I turned on uh, PBS to watch the latest episode of Finding Your Roots, one of my, I would call it a guilty pleasure. It's just a pleasure. Um, I love that show. And so I was watching that and little Miss Lilith decided she needed to, um, take a nap on my um, lap while I did that. So um, my little break ended up being a little bit longer because you know, the, there is a rule, it's an unwritten rule, but it's a, still a very strict rule that um, if you're sitting down and your cat curls up on your lap and falls asleep, then you're there until that cat does, decides that it is done with its nap. So. Um, I watched that and then I watched a few things on YouTube and, uh, now I'm back. And while I was watching, well, then she got up and I had some to prepare. So these aprons take, uh, bias tape binding to edge them just to, uh, finish off 
the unfinished raw edges. And you can buy bias tape binding in your local store, but uh, this one, they include in the pattern how to use your the same fabric, or you can get a contrasting fabric to make your own binding. And like I said earlier, I don't think I want to use up more of that hand dyed fabric for bias binding, but I have a small little stack of twin size sh sheets here. Uh, I no longer have a twin size bed uh, anywhere in my house, and they're mostly all left over from my daughter's college beds or their, when they would lived at home, the twin beds that they had in their bedrooms. And they're long gone and grown, so I don't need to keep these sheets around anymore. And I was going to donate them to either uh, a shelter or um, the something, you know, donate them. But then I'm like, well, this is really good cotton fabric and large pieces of fabric. So I just kept them. Um, and I have this off-white one here, kind of a creamy beige kind of color. And I thought that's a good color for both of these two fabrics, especially the, the gray and blue one. So I thought, let's just make binding, let's just make the binding out of this. So this was a fitted sheet. So it had the elastic all the way around and it had the corners sewn. So while I was watching the last YouTube video, uh, I took my scissors and cut the elastic off. And then I ripped it, um, ripped these so that I know that the edges are square to the uh, grain line. This is just like part of the sheet, but this will be more than enough for the two, I'm pretty sure more than enough for the two different um, aprons. So that's my next step. I'm gonna make that and then get the bindings pressed, get the kitten. She's not a kitten anymore. I keep calling her a kitten. She's almost two years old. But she, when, you, when your other aunt, two animals in the house, cats in the house are like 15 and 16 or 14 and 16. I don't remember how old. Yeah, at least. Maybe. Yeah, they're old. Let's just say that. And, and this one's just a baby in comparison. She will always be the kitten. Won't you, baby girl? Hi. Go to nap. Yeah, I'm glad you did. You cry. Where are you going? You're not getting from the table. Oh, you're going to go over there. Just don't burn yourself on the iron. All right. I will be back uh, after I cut this bias binding and press it. Well, sew it, press it, and then maybe I'll show you how to put it on if you're interested. There you have it. Yards and yards and yards and yards of bias binding. I'm going to, I'm going to take it to the ironing board, press each of the seams that I just made, the little two and a half inch seams, press them open, then trim the little, um, the little uh, ears, as I call them, off that where they uh, overlap, just so everything is exactly even. So then what you do is you're going to press it, not quite in half, you're going to press it so that one side is about an eighth of an inch wider than the other, or, you know, sticks over the edge about an eighth of an inch. Press that in half, and then where that, uh, where the crease is, open it, and then fold each side into that crease. Again, I'm not measuring and I'm not pressing right now, so this is not going to turn out exact. I'll give you an idea. Press those in and then press it back in half, and that will have one side be a little bit wider than the other. So then when you go to sew it on, you sew it from this side, the narrow side, and then you're, then you're guaranteed to be catching the back side. And you can sew it all on in one go. Um, if it were even, even, and anything shifted, you might not be catching the back side as you're sewing. And um, I might show you how to do that. <laughs> we'll see. So I have my binding strips all made and pressed. And as you can see, I think you can see can it, that, uh, you know, it's offset by about an eighth of an inch or so. And I think I'm done for today. One, it's, I don't have my watch on, but it's getting, it's getting afternoon. And I have been in here or in the living room inside the house all day. And it's a beautiful sunny Saturday. So I may take Cass out for a little 
stroll around the neighborhood if he wants or figure out what I'm going to do for dinner. Something, something. So I'm just going to bundle up my uh, strip here. And the other reason that I'm not going to uh, try to put this on tonight, at least right now, maybe a little later this evening, if the lighting, if I have enough light in here, but because my assistant has moved and she has decided to see if those aprons work for a comfortable cat bed. I had to kick her off the uh, um, ironing board when I wanted to press these. And so she moved over and I gave her a little soft thing to lay on. But of course, being a cat, she didn't want what I had offered her. She wanted what she wanted. <laughs> So I'm going to let her have it. She'll probably move if I turn off the lights and leave the room. But uh, my back is, I haven't done a lot of sewing lately or cutting or just any of this kind of work in a minute. So let me know what you think of this little project. Let me know if you've got some any suggestions or ideas or questions. And um, also let me know if you think these aprons would be something that you'd like to see me add to my shop because um, there, as you can see, they're, they're not super quick to make. Um, once I get all the patterns and the different sizes uh, traced and cut out and ready to go, that takes more time than anything, and making the binding takes more time um, than the sewing of the actual apron. So time-wise, I should be able to make them, uh, that keep that, Affor semi-affordable that part of it and uh, depending on what fabrics I use I could probably keep that reasonably priced as well so um, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head today how much I would be have to charge for an apron like this um, but as you can see it's made with love it's made with sustainable and um, recyclable materials and um, so it's good for you good for the earth and Hey, you know what? It would be good for me to have a few more items in my shop that I could sell and I uh, have people interested in. I know I haven't done any shop updates. Uh, it's viralpathhealingarts.com slash store. Uh, there are a few items from before times, before the divorce, before moving, before having to start uh, doing my other businesses full time. Um, so there are still some items there that uh, need new homes. And so if there's anything there that you'd like, please take a minute to check it out. And um, I will, my intention is, especially during these slower times right now, <clears throat> through till now until probably when people start going on spring break, um, my pet sitting business usually has a little bit of a lull in January and February. Um, a lull to the point of my income usually get, gets cut by anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. That's um, considerable. So um, if I, during those, this time that I'm in a little bit of a lull in that business, I do intend to get in here and get making some more things. There have been a few people who have um, I've talked to recently who are um, into, have been interested in the um, Bridget wraps the flat uh, altar scarf wraps that I was making and um, I sold quite a few of those last year and have do not have as many in stock anymore and I need to dye fabric to make some. So that is um, on my agenda for coming going forward here in the next few weeks is to get some fabrics dyed and um, get some of those made and relisted. So keep an eye out for those and maybe I'll do a little um, video when I'm doing either the fabric or the sewing of those and um, let you know when those are updated. But if there's any other styles there that you'd like to see more of, let me know. Or um, I don't, that said, I don't sew on commission for people uh, anymore. It's too stressful <laughs> and it ends up not being can't say worth it. That is too negative. And not just because I'm trying not to be negative, but it's not that it's not worth it. If I make something for someone that they desire and they want and they're happy with it in the end, then it was worth it. Um, and I do enjoy, I well, I do like to enjoy my time, my creative time. 
I don't get as much of it as I'd like to get. So I like it to be as enjoyable as possible. Sometimes when I'm doing something that's uh, on demand or on commission, uh, the enjoyment goes out of it because I'm so stressed about doing it perfectly. And I'm, well, I'm always trying to do things as, as well as I possibly can. And I do put a lot of pride in my workmanship. But uh, when it's, yeah. And then if the, if the customer is asking for specific things, then sometimes it can get a little nitpicky. And then I'm stressing out over it instead of enjoying the process. And um, I have debated over and over again in going back into doing things to, for, to add or, uh, to on order for people. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any input on that idea, let me know. Um, because in order to do something commission-wise and on demand for people, uh, I need to charge quite a bit of money for the time and skill that it takes me to do that. And um, I love a quote I saw uh, on this similar topic. Okay, that's all. The, it's, a, it's a big roll of bias binding tape. Um, I saw a quote not too long ago that um, I have to keep in mind when I'm doing things like that. And it is, you're not paying me only for the time it takes me to make something. Uh, now that I've got the binding made and a few things, I could probably whip up one of those aprons in an hour, approximately, from laying the fabric out, cutting the fabric to sewing and pressing and finish start to finish, especially now that I've, I've made it once. Um, so I say, well, what's an hour's worth of work worth? Well, the thing is, it, there's, you're not just paying, wouldn't be just paying the person, an artisan or a craftsperson for the time it takes them to make that object. You're paying them for the time, it, all the time it's taken them up to now to learn the skills, to be able to make it in that amount of time, to uh, the years of experience, the prototypes that they've made pre previously that didn't turn out so well. Um, but all that time is what brings me to the final product that is what I feel is uh, worthy of putting my name on and putting it out there in the world. So keep that in mind when you're at a uh, craft fair, art fair, um, an art exhibit, um, or you know even Etsy or something like that, if you're actually looking on Etsy for actual handmade items, not dropship items and all the other things that have kind of taken over Etsy in the last few years, which is why my shop is not on Etsy anymore. Um, but anyway, so I'm debating, I'm considering, because I'm in a process right now of really, I've gotten through the divorce, I've gotten through the living on my own and settling in and figuring out my budgets and figuring out my time and how much I have to work at my income producing work um, and then finding the balance between that and finding the time to rest and relax and rejuvenate myself, to have time for my spiritual um, endeavors and for some of the other things that are important to me, like my work with my sisters for the Weird Sisters um, every, every quarter or so. Well, actually it's more than every quarter, but yeah. Um, and a cross quote or quarter and quarter and um, all those things, trying to find the balances and things. And also to just, this is still, I'm still in this transition phase right now. I'm transitioning from my old married life, wife, mom, employee, all those things um, to this new single life. That's mine, all mine uh, as a crone um, and doing it on my own, figuring it all out by myself. And what do I want my crone years to look like? Where do I want to live? What do I want to do? And what's my average day look like? Um, I want to continue working for as long as I continue working uh, with animals like I've been doing, but I'd also like to be able to explore some of the other things that um, have always been important to me. I'd like to get back into doing more healing work and especially specifically more sound healing work. I would like to find a place that either already 
ideally already has um, quite a bit of permaculture or gardens put in that I can add to. I, I want fruit trees and flowers and roses and vegetables and maybe chickens and um, just a wild garden. I do again. And um, I want uh, to be able to cr continue to create the sustainable zero waste lifestyle that I'm trying to move toward all those things. And so um, trying to figure out how I can support that and um, have every morning that I wake up excited to uh, to see what I have to what I get to do that day. You know, do I get to take care of animals that day? Do I get to sew that day? Do I get to do some yard work and gardening that day or cooking? Do I get to make some videos and upload them and, and build community um, on the internet? Um, what do I get to do every day? And I want to have a vision of what that looks like that's very clear so that I know when I get there, but I also know as every day decision that I make uh, day to day, is that moving me more toward that goal? And um, so, I'm going to leave you with that and I will maybe show you a finished apron if the kitten never wakes up. Look at her. She shifted just a little bit. She just looks so comfy and cozy there on that table. So I think I'm going to let her be and I'm going to go either make another cup of tea. I have a cold one sitting over there from earlier that I never finished. So I think I'll dump that one out, um, dump it into my compost and start a new cup. And uh, I'm thinking maybe lemon balm sounds like a nice lemon balm. Oh, or so I can join the kitten here. I might uh, brew a little lemon balm and catnip tea. Chamomile catnip. Something relaxing and, and uh, refreshing like that, I think, is going to be my plan for today. So here we go, finished project. Uh, in the back, crisscross this, so just slide, goes over the head and the arms go in. So there's no sashes or buttons or um, closures. And nice big pockets. And again, this is a size small and I'm probably around a, where a size 12 to 14. So this is a six to eight. So I will make this again for myself and probably the large size so that it really crisscrosses much deeper in the back because like i said i kind of like to make this in the longer length it's past my knees hi cassie and uh just to be able to wear a pair of leggings and a t-shirt or a tank top or something under it especially in the summertime is almost like a little sundress um but uh overall i'm really happy with the final results and also I think if I did the larger size, um, it's gonna be longer and those pockets are gonna be more down here on me in the longer size and the larger size. But in general, I'm pretty happy.